Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Thank you for joining us for our May Nonprofit Cafe. My name is Jill Elwood, and I am the Nonprofit Programming and Relations Manager at One Valley Community Foundation, where our mission is to connect people who care to causes that matter to build a better community. And one of the ways that we do that is supporting our amazing nonprofit sector. We are absolutely thrilled to be bringing you this program this morning. Um, before we dive in and get going, I have a couple reminders and housekeeping items. Um, first and foremost, this is going to be a relatively interactive session as all of our nonprofit cafe sessions are. So we invite you, I know it's Friday morning and your hair might be a mess, but please, if you could turn on those screens, we will be having breakout rooms and conversations and those are always a bit more fun if you can actually see the people you are speaking with. Um, we also would love for everyone to introduce themselves. Um, I know it's still a virtual, virtual event and we don't get to quite have the same networking that we used to, but if you could just take a moment to, oh, look at that. I accidentally pasted the part that says copy and paste into chat. If you could take a moment and introduce yourself, if you could please add your name, your organization to the chat box, we would love to see who's here today. Also, if you are under a Zoom account, that is not your name. If you could rename yourself so people in your breakout rooms know who you are, that would be amazing. Good morning, Tori. Thank you for introducing yourself. Good morning, Priya. Thank you everyone so much for being here today. All right. For those of you just joining, we are just introducing ourselves in the chat box. Thank you, Tanya. Um, also, just quick, going to throw it out there because she's on the call this morning. We got a new staff member and we are so thrilled and she just introduced herself in the chat. Tanya Andreasen is our new chat, our new team member. So I hope you all get the chance to meet her at some point. Um, good morning, Mary. Oh, Karen, good to put a face with a name. Oh, fantastic. Ah. Oh. So many reasons I love this program. Hi, Chris. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. All right, we are going to get going. So as we do today's presentation, as I said, if you could leave your video on, that would be awesome. If you could leave yourself on mute, if we are not in a breakout room, that would be amazing as well. I also do want to let everyone know that this session is being recorded. So if you want to watch it later or share it with teammates, you are welcome to do so. And we will have a couple of breakout rooms. Those will not be recorded. So when you're in your breakout rooms, um, A, just know that that's not recorded, but B, if you need to remember any of that, make sure that you write it down or take notes because we won't have access to that later. Um, let's see, let's see. And then the last thing I wanna mention before I turn it over is that this program takes a break for the summer so that we can regroup and plan for next year. So this is our last nonprofit cafe session until August. If you have some awesome knowledge that you want to share with the nonprofit sector, I invite you to go to our website and fill out a proposal to be a speaker. We are looking for speakers for our 2021-2022 year, and we would love for you all to share your knowledge. Um, that's a big part of Nonprofit Cafe is sharing what you all know with the rest of your colleagues. So I hope you will consider doing that. But now I'm going to turn it over to our amazing speakers. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce two women who I not only have personally taken great writing courses with, but have partnered with on a variety of programs. And I am so, so honored and happy to have Bree and Hannah here today. So I'm gonna turn it over to them to share some knowledge. Awesome. Thank you, Jill. And good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here on a Friday and like a Memorial weekend Friday, no less. So we really appreciate you getting up early and being here with us. Um, I'm going to take just a moment to share my screen. Also, just so you all know, Pri and I may be really... <laughs> in the uh, grant space, but we are still figuring out Zoom and technology things. So bear with us if we uh, have any technical difficulties. I should have let you keep your screen up. Huh? Because I had her close her screen so I could see all your faces as we were introducing ourselves this morning. Ah, there we go. Beautiful. All right, can everyone see my screen? 
Awesome. Okay, so uh, I'm going to pass this over to Bree first, just so she can introduce herself, and then I'll introduce myself. Hello, everyone. Thank you, as Hannah said, for being here on Memorial Day weekend. Um, I know a lot of people like to hit the road early to do something fun, especially if we might see some sunshine. Um, my name is Bree. I founded the Dotted Eye in 2014. And so for the past six years, we've been working with nonprofits to find and secure grant funding to reach their mission and goals. We absolutely love the work that we do. Um, we also train nonprofit leaders so that they can um, find and secure grants on their own successfully and with the confidence that they can do it well. So we're excited to share some info today. And Hannah will lead this because she's amazing when it comes to leading. So enjoy today. I will be in the breakout rooms and answering questions as well. Thanks, Bri. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Hannah, and I have worked with Brianna and the Dotted Eye since 2017. Um, my background is in uh, child development and education and community health, so it's really fun to kind of put all of those things together and apply it to grant writing. My parents, uh, my dad and my stepmom are actually both journalists, so I've grown up around writing and technical writing. Uh, and storytelling. So it's always been a passion of mine. And I'm really excited today to kind of share some techniques and really some mindset shifts on how you can level up your grant writing. Uh, I, I don't want to say that there's anything, you know, oh, I shouldn't sell myself short, I guess saying mind blowing, but um, grant writing can be really simple. And I really want to share that with you today by by just going over some of these tips. Um, but before we do that, you know, we all, I think, are missing in-person um, events. Well, maybe not all of us. I'm sure some introverts in the room are really glad that we have Zoom and can turn their screen off. Um, but we would love to just give everyone the opportunity to kind of network um, and, sorry guys, my, uh, my screen's being real slow. Um, we're gonna take a, a few minutes, uh, maybe five to 10 minutes to kind of get into breakout rooms. Bree and I are gonna kind of pop between some of the breakout rooms. Um, and I'd love for you all to just introduce yourself, you know, to your peers and really, really think about these questions and, and talk through them. What are some of the components of grant writing that you feel that you struggle with? And I know grant seeking as a whole, there are a bunch of different components that we may struggle with, but really thinking about the writing piece. What is it about telling that story or writing that, you know, proposal that you feel you struggle with? And then because we're all about bringing back the positivity, what are areas or elements of writing that you feel like you do well? Um, Jill, I'm going to have you have everyone go into breakout rooms. I don't know if I need to stop sharing my screen for that, but. You um, are good. As okay. soon as you are ready, I just put the instructions in the chat. So if people forget what Hannah asked you to discuss, it is there and ready. Um, and then we will open all rooms. Give me just one second to do that. Awesome. Um, all right, everyone, we will see you in about 10 minutes. All righty, everyone is coming back. It looks like all the breakout rooms have closed up. We'll turn that back over to Ms. Hannah. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I know I'm going to be that person that everyone doesn't like because I'm going to make you share with the class, but. Uh, if anyone from some of the breakout rooms wants to just kind of give like a summary or some of the key takeaways that you guys discussed in the breakout rooms, what are some of the common things that you struggle with? What are, what are areas you feel like you're actually really killing it in? And if you don't feel like speaking out loud to the, the, whole, uh, the whole audience, please feel free to type something in the chat if you feel more comfortable doing that. I know, um, from some of the rooms I was in, um, there was some conversation about how to be concise. Uh, just starting the writing process can be overwhelming, which I know I struggle with too, expressing the need. Um, 
and we're all kind of still getting used to things being online, right? That's, you know, grants kind of toe the line of sometimes you write a hard copy, sometimes it's online, but people are still kind of adjusting to that too. What else did, did people talk about? I'll say it came up in our group, the, the conciseness. That's something that I struggle with is just, you know, when I only have 200 words, it's hard. Mm -hmm. um, but then we actually had someone who is um, opposite of that uh, in our group that said, you know, she actually likes the conciseness of grant writing. She said she's not a very, you know, she's not one of those creative writers that likes to write a lot. She really likes the cut and dry mm -hmm. grant writing. Awesome. I love that. We're going to talk about some of these things too. So I love hearing that. Anyone else want to share? Awesome. Glad, I'm glad you guys were having fun in the breakout room. Uh, and I'm glad yeah. What our group chatted about. Mm -hmm. So one of the things um, I heard was feeling like they have been writing for quite a while and now they're feeling like their content might be just a little bit stale, like, um, you know, wondering how they can freshen it up. Um, so I thought that that was interesting. Wow. Um, and then a couple of other things that came up while not exactly related to writing, but you and I feel are so important when, you know, we talk about writing was like making sure they're identifying the right funder for the right program or what they're doing. And so I know we won't get into that, but um, in too much detail, but we definitely do say, you know, one of the things we see so often are people aren't having success. It's not so much that your writing isn't great. It's that you're writing to the wrong person. Right. Um, so I did see that come up and then um, what was my other little note? Oh, and then that creating relationships with funders too, just how, you know, sometimes that's the last thing on their mind, but also just wanted to touch on there are a lot of things that make the writing even more impactful. We, with the short time we have today, won't get to all of those things, but it was nice to hear people were aware of it. Yeah, I love that. Like Bree said, you know, there are so many things to this grant seeking process that do influence your writing or have an effect on the outcome that we unfortunately don't have time for today. And I could talk about for hours, um, but I, I'm glad too that people are, are noticing that. That's great. Um, all right, is everyone ready to get started? Awesome. Okay, so what we really wanna talk about today is how to level up your grant writing. And I wanted to just say that I think there's a stigma around grant writing that it's kind of intimidating or that it's hard because as some people said, you know, either I'm too wordy or I'm very technical and very direct. Um, some people don't like writing and they don't have the confidence to do it or, you know, they're not seeing success. So it feels like this kind of hard obstacle to overcome. Um, and at the heart of grant writing, right, is really projecting to a funder your message. Who are you? What are you doing? Why are you doing it? Right. And how are you accomplishing that? And while that's definitely a very oversimplification of the process and the requirements that go into grant writing and writing these proposals to funders, I think it's important for us to have that mindset shift and not build ourselves up to think, oh my gosh, this is a mountain I have to climb, grant writing so hard, but really starting to get down to the basics that we all live and breathe in our nonprofits and organizations every day, right? You know who you are, you know what you do and why you need it and how are you accomplishing that? You know, we talk with our volunteers, with our teammates, with donors, right? With our family members about all the ins and outs of the good, the bad, the ugly of our organizations and programs. Um, and I think we can translate that into our grant writing, right? Like we know our message and it's just about how we share it. Um, and what we wanted to do today is really talk about some simple techniques to take some of your writing to the next level or maybe reinvigorate your writing, right? If people are feeling like it's stale, some of these tips might help you spice it up. Um, and I wanted to first go over some of the common pitfalls that we've run into, which it sounds like we've all kind of shared with each other today. Um, because knowing where some of us struggle, I think knowing these tips and how it applies to some of these things is gonna be really helpful because 
grant writing doesn't have to be hard or scary if we think of it more simply and just do some quick shifts, quick tweaks to our technique or our writing. Um, that can really make it easier and more fun, in my opinion. So some of the pitfalls we run into are being too direct, right? I do not want to say that this is necessarily a bad thing. None of the things on this list are necessarily bad, right? They just sometimes give us trouble. And being too direct, right? If you, um, if you're very concise, which again is a skill that I need to take some from, I am one of the wordy people in this group. Uh, it is a very valuable skill because you're getting right to the point. But sometimes when we're too direct or we think in that very kind of analytical mind where it's like, well, I've answered the question so I can move on. We might miss some of the feeling and the emotion in our writing that a funder wants to feel, right? We're all looking to feel something and a funder wants to connect to your cause and know that they're making an impact and that you're doing good work. And sometimes if we're too direct, they miss that, right? We don't have that emotion, those tugging at the heartstrings. And the flip side of that is using too much detail. Again, this is where I struggle. So you are not alone in this boat if you struggle with this too is that sometimes when we are more creative and we're the touchy feely type and we like to use real fluffy flowery language and metaphors and anecdotes, um, sometimes we dance around the question and it's like, well, that's beautiful and it's well written, but what the heck are you talking about? You didn't answer the question, right? And a funder is gonna say, well, that, that sounds great, but I don't actually know how you're making an impact because you haven't actually told me. And that can be a pitfall we fall into. Um, another thing that we see people struggle with, and again, you know, Bree and I struggle with these things too, is that assuming the funder knows about your issue or cause that you're supporting or writing about, um, or understands what your program is or what your project is doing. I think, and this is where I know word counts can really kind of stymie things because when you have a word count limit or a character limit, you're trying to think about, okay, what can I say in this amount of time? And, and sometimes detail gets cut because we have character limits. But that's something to think about when you're writing is, am I assuming that the funder understands what I'm talking about? Or do I need to cut something different because I've cut out the detail that, that tells them this is what I'm doing? Um, using jargon, you know, industry specific language is also something that I fall into when I'm presenting, um, as well as when I'm writing. When I really adopt a nonprofit's, you know, program, sometimes I get used to the language that they're using and the acronyms and things like that. And it can be confusing. Again, back to the assuming the funder understands, we can't assume that. And then not supporting your claims. So making, making claims or saying things, you know, making it statements that say, oh, we're going to change the world, which is great. We all want to change the world. But how, what, give me data, give me stories. How are you doing that, right? Sometimes we make statements without backing it up just because they sound good um, and we don't necessarily have all the support for it. So thinking about some of these things that we struggle with, um, give me a minute guys, my computer. We're gonna talk about next, some of the things to think about in your writing. Okay, now again, I don't want you to think that this is the end all be all to up leveling your writing or becoming a better writer. There are so many techniques that you can use and classes you can take to be a better writer or learn about the grant seeking process that'll help your writing. Um, but these are simple things that we can do. And in my opinion, some of these are more creative things. And that's one of the things that I'm really passionate about is trying to give some of the fun and the creativeness and joy that we feel in our organizations, like back into the writing process. I think because grant writing is a little more impersonal than face-to-face than -face donor soliciting, right? Um, it can feel a little intimidating because you don't really know who you're talking to. So it can feel very like very professional and very technical and um, but you're telling a story and it can still be fun and it's okay to have fun. So these are some things to think about. Um, and they're just simple shifts. And these are what we're gonna focus on today. But if you have other questions about how to tweak your writing, please reach out to us. We would be happy to talk with you um, about other, other techniques you can use.
Um, so some of the things to think about, vary your sentence structure to create rhythm. And we're going to go into these in more detail. Uh, again, avoid jargon, right? We don't want to confuse funders or make them uh, not understand what we're saying. Reflect the language a funder uses back to them in their writing. So again, when Brie was talking about that alignment, right? That's one tip, that's one trick you can use to make sure a funder is the right fit. If there's, if there's some buzzwords or keywords that you see in their grant guidelines that you feel like, yes, that resonates with what we're doing, then it's probably, you know, a, a good alignment. Um, and you want to show them that. So we'll, we'll talk a little more about that. Um, and again, using data to add weight and impact. This is also a really great way to spice up your writing, in my opinion. Um, if you're kind of getting bored with what you've been saying for the last year, right? Um, and then I love this. I, I think it's fun. I don't think we think about this when we're writing grants, right? But what tone or mood are you trying to create? right? You're telling a story and it's okay to make the funder feel something and, and write with the mood in mind that you're trying to evoke. Um, so we're going to go into these a little bit more in depth here. And we're going to start with varying your sentence structure once my screen changes. <laughs> um, there we go. Okay. So what I'm going to do is just talk through this a little bit and then give you some examples of what this kind of looks like in action. So varying your sentence structure is one of the easiest things, in my opinion, that you can do to change up your writing. Not only make it more um, exciting sounding, but if it's, it's feeling a little stale, play around with the sentence structure, style, and length. Um, this means using a combination of short and long sentences, using simple sentences and compound sentences, right, um, to create rhythm. And I know this seems like so simple, but it, it really is this easy to, to change up your writing and give it a little spice. Um, because for me, I talk about this in our grant training all the time. I'm big on flow right? If, if it has a nice flow, that's what I'm going for. I want my writing to have a cadence, a rhythm that really brings you along the story, right? It's not stagnant um, or too direct for me. Um, and there's something about rhythm that really keeps your reader engaged. And I want you to think about this because when you turn on the radio, right, and you hear a song that you love, in, in music, right, it's called the hook, right, the, in the melody, right, there's that hook, they're like, oh yeah, that's the part I like. And we can do that with writing, right, we can create a rhythm or a cadence that keeps readers engaged and they're like, okay, I'm listening to what you're saying because there's a nice flow, there's a nice structure of the sentences that doesn't feel impersonal or robotic. And I'm going to kind of show you what that means. Um, because this is not to say that short sentences are bad or long flowery sentences are bad or one's better than the other. Um, again, sometimes being direct when you have a character limit is the best skill you can have, um, but you might be missing out on keeping your reader engaged uh, if it's too direct, right? If it just sounds really staccato. And I'm gonna show you what that means kind of in, in practice. I want you to, see this. Okay, so this is actually writing that I've, some of this is from um, clients of mine that I've either written for or we've worked together on in our trainings. I tried to take out the uh, identifiers, but some of these things uh, flipped. Um, so this says, our organization is a 160 seat nonprofit community theater in every town, Montana. Our mission is to put the spotlight on education, inspiration and community through the performing arts. We serve 4,500 people in every town county annually. Over half of them are low income or, or over 40, 55. Additionally, 10% of our programs are dedicated to children. Every season we produce a, a mix of year round performances, classes, workshops and community events. Now, this is not a bad paragraph. It's, it's telling a lot of information. It's using some statistics. It's using numbers. Um, there, there's good elements to this. But for me, right, there's, 
it's missing a cadence or a rhythm. It's very kind of abrupt. Even though these sentences aren't necessarily super short, some of them are, and some of them are more simple, which is fine. Um, but it gives this kind of robotic sound or this feel, which again, is not necessarily a bad thing, but if you're trying to create feeling in your reader, that may not be the tactic you wanna use. So we changed it. And again, I'm so sorry to my, my lovely trainee. We worked together on this um, and I, I missed taking out their name, but uh, since the 1970s, Hamilton Players Community Theater has been providing Rivoli County with exceptional live theater, community enrichment and education. Located in Hamilton, Montana, our mission is to put the spotlight on education, inspiration and community through the performing arts. As the only community theater within a 20 mile radius, we fill a unique role in our community by providing access to arts and culture programming, youth enrichment and volunteer opportunities for all ages and abilities. Now, is this the only way to rephrase kind of what we are saying? There's a lot of things we did to tweak this. Absolutely not. There's a lot of different ways we can approach this. But because we are working on that sentence structure, we really wanted them to feel, especially from an arts organization, we wanted there to be more of a rhythm. So instead of having these really kind of staccato, more simple sentences, we did a combination of some simple and more complex sentences so that there's more of a flow, there's more of a rhythm, and it doesn't feel so robotic. Okay. If you have any questions on that, please feel free to put them in the chat um, and we'll have times for some Q&A after. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is avoiding jargon and reflecting funders language. Now, this it's a pretty easy fix. And again, it's really simple. Um, but because we're writing in our industry day in and day out, it's really easy to get stuck there. And sometimes we don't even realize that we're using jargon or industry specific language that a funder doesn't understand because we just innately know it now. Um, and that's okay, we all kind of get the blinders on at times, right? But it's good to kind of have that, that thought, be like, okay, I need to check myself before I submit this, am I using too much industry specific language that I either need to explain or take out? Um, am I using acronyms that I haven't properly designated what they are? Um, and, and try to just make that a check for yourself, right? When you're writing, go through and see, or one of the best ways you can do this is not only write it yourself and check, but have someone read your narrative that does not have an affiliation with your organization. They're definitely an outsider or a third party who's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And if someone who is outside of your organization is like, I really don't understand what you're saying here, or this acronym makes no sense to me, then that's a good indicator that a funder may not know. And there's obviously some wiggle room here with this. Some funders are very industry specific, right? If you're writing to a very high tech, you know, scientific research center, uh, and they're using a lot of technical language in their grant guidelines, um, that's probably a good indicator that they have a pulse of the industry and you might be able to say more of that, right? And this is where reflecting the funder's language can really come into, into play because A, it gives you an indicator of how to kind of approach your writing if their writing is very technical and industry specific, you can kind of be like, okay, I may not have to worry as much about the acronyms and the industry specific language because they get it. I can tell from their guidelines. But again, we don't want to assume things. So we still wanna make sure we're explaining things in a way that is clear. Um, but also when you're reading the guidelines, that's a great way to see where their focus and priorities are. And when you're trying to sound compelling to a funder, 
you want to show them that I am such a good fit for you. We are so aligned in our mission and vision and the work that I am doing is not only going to make an impact in my community, but it's going to help you accomplish your mission. And we can do that by reflecting the language that they use in those guidelines back to them, just like a mirror. Um, and you don't want to lose yourself, right, and just completely adopt their language uh, and lose the, the grit of your organization or who you are. Um, but it is, it is nice to highlight some of those overlaps um, and reflect some of that language back to them, uh, maybe in, in your program or in your need statement saying, hey, you want to serve youth? Uh, in Gallatin Valley, we serve youth in Gallatin Valley, or you're dedicated to workforce development. Well, guess what? We have a workforce development program and kind of use some of the language as a mirror. So they go, oh yeah, we're aligned. We do that and they do that. And again, this is so simple and you've probably heard this before, but it's a nice reminder to think about when you just wanna level up and take your writing to the next level. These are little things that you can do that just give it clarity, and when you reflect language, it can really help uh, show a funder that you're a good fit, um, and that's what's gonna take it to the next level for you. Hannah, can I step in really quick? Yes, you can. One of the other questions, or um, I guess struggles that somebody brought up is, is when they ask somebody for edits, you know, these people are coming back and saying like, oh, grammatically, you could reword the sentence or, you know, oh, this was misspelled, but looks great. Um, I think that one of the key things when you're finding somebody to look at your work is making sure that you're being really clear about the feedback that you're looking for, right? So identifying that person and saying, hey, this is the guidelines for this proposal and these are my responses. And I would love to hear if you think I've answered their questions correctly, or if you're feeling like you still don't really grasp what I do. Um, and then letting them know, hey, it's really important that you know you're not hurting my feelings. I need this constructive criticism to be better. So I think if you set the tone with that, then people are going to be a little bit more helpful. Absolutely, Brie, that's such a great point. I love, I love that. And it is a really helpful thing is, is conveying to people, this is the, you know, you don't want to lead them to give you only the answers you want, but it is helpful when you say, I'm looking for this kind of feedback. Um, because personally, and I've told this to a lot of trainees and you, if you're an English major in the room, you may be like, oh, some of these sentences are not grammatically correct. I and my copy editor dad would probably cringe at a few of the things I write because grammatically or structurally, they're not following all of the rules of the English language. But something to think about too is when you write, you know, we're not writing to get an A necessarily, we're writing to get funded, right? You're trying to get someone to support you and that doesn't necessarily mean always following the rules that we've been taught throughout our lives, right? I tend to like to write the way that people speak and the way I like to read things. And that doesn't always match up with the English rules. Um, that's not to say you can just nix all the grammatical rules altogether. We still want you to have good grammar um, and some federal guidelines may be like, no, you need to follow the rules. But um, it is nice to know that, you know, it's about telling a story and creating feeling. And sometimes that means, you know, not having your uh, grammatically correct friend <laughs> proofread your, I have not sent anything to my copy editor dad because I know he'd probably take a red pen to all of it. Um, so Bree, thank you for saying that. I, that's a really great point. Um, okay, to, to bring us back to this, um, one of the things with jargon and these are just quick, quick examples and just kind of a check for you um, is to see, again, none of these are bad pieces of writing. Uh, one of my clients had this and, you know, it was as of February 2021, our organization is a registered apprenticeship service provider with DOL. When I read this, I had an idea of what DOL was based off of our conversations about the project. But does anyone here like know with 100% certainty what DOL means? Right, like it could mean a bunch of different things depending on the community you're in. Maybe it's a company, maybe it's a program acronym. Um, 
we're not clear, it's not clear, right? Where what they were trying to say was, oh no, I've, oh, here we go. I'm sorry, got myself confused. We're down here, sorry guys. Uh, down here, right, we have it more clear. They were trying to say the Department of Labor. And while DOL is an accurate acronym, they hadn't said what that was. So we changed it to be as of February 2021, our organization is a registered apprenticeship service provider with the North Carolina Department of Labor. And what you can do after that, which I didn't uh, do here, but you kind of see in some of these other examples is if I wanted to then continue using that acronym so I didn't have to spell this out every time, I would just in parentheses put Department of Labor, right, the DOL, if that's the acronym I was going to use throughout the rest of the application moving forward. Simple tweak, it just gave it more clarity, right? Um, and again, I know sometimes we have to sacrifice clarity a little bit when we have word limits. But again, I'd ask myself, okay, what do I need here? Do I need clarity or do I need to really create, do I need more space to create more feeling, right? Because sometimes it can be a give and take. Um, we always wanna make sure we have clarity and detail in our writing. Um, but when you have a hundred word character limit, sometimes we have to make those hard choices. Uh, another example would be upon successful completion, um, participants attend our 12 week uh, IT fundamentals course, which leads to CompTIA's ITF plus certification. Again, does anyone know what CompTIA ITF plus is? Maybe if we have some, some IT people in the room, but when I read this first, I was like, okay, I can make a guess as to what these are, but I had no idea what CompTIA was and we were using this word throughout the grants that we were writing. I was like, okay, we need to make this a little more clear. In ITF plus, again, I can guess what that is, but I had to look it up. So we changed it to, uh, upon successful completion, participants attend our 12 week IT fundamentals, which is what ITF plus is. It's an IT fundamentals plus course. So we just put that acronym right after it so then a funder would know okay this is what they're meaning and they're going to use this you know throughout the rest of the grant they'll understand because they've seen it first uh, which leads to itf plus certification from the computing technology technology industry association in parentheses comp tia now again i'm not one to say that you you know there are times where i've used acronyms uh because i don't have the space right? I don't have the space to write everything out. Um, and I am putting a little bit of trust in the funder that they're going to figure it out. Or I've decided that because of who the funder is and their industry, I can guess or sacrifice a little bit of that because they're in IT or they're very into STEM, uh, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. I can say, okay, you know what? This comp TIA is an industry uh, they're very big in the industry. They're kind of industry standard for this certification. I'm going to wager, just going to make a guess that they understand. And sometimes we make those decisions. Um, but again, I would just ask yourself when you are writing and, and you're trying to cut characters or cut words, really think about what the question is asking and why are you using the language or the words that you are. Are you saying it because it adds to your narrative and then adds to your need uh, and gives more context? Or are you saying it just because it sounds good? And I know I am guilty of this. There are phrases I latch onto. I'm like, oh, that sounds so good. That's so impactful. And then I get to the word limit. I'm like, dang it, I'm 20 words over. And I read through it and I read through it and I don't want to cut the phrase that I like because it sounds so good. And then I'm like, it's not adding anything to this narrative. It's not furthering my point. It's not giving additional context. It just sounds really impactful. I hate it, but I'm going to have to cut it, right? And that's some, something you can kind of ask yourself is, why am I saying this? Is it helping advance my point or am I just using it because I think it sounds good? That's kind of something you can ask yourself as you write. And I want to add one quick point to oh, the... Um, using abbreviations. 
Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't realize because you may be speaking with the um, program manager, right? And you're like, okay, well, I've, I'm creating this relationship with them. So they already know what ITF plus is. They yeah. know these things. But most often the people that are reading these applications are reading a lot of these applications and they don't have time to Google search what your acronym might mean, nor do they want to. Yep. Um, and then also these people could be somebody not at all, even in this industry, you know, there have been times that I have been pulled in on um, a review committee and it has nothing to do with the work that I do. And yep. so, you know, you just really don't know who all is in on that review committee. So I think that that's why we're trying to drive this point home so clearly about you really need to understand that you probably don't know what this person knows about your program. Absolutely. Um, and that's so true. I, you know, you, you don't know who the reviewer is. And that's one of the reasons some of these, uh, and you'll kind of, it'll kind of wrap up too when we talk about data and really using language and data together to create a balance because you're going to get people who are more creatively touchy feely minded and you're going to get the people who like conciseness, who want you to get to the point and they want you to have data to back it up. And you want to appeal to kind of all of those people, right? Um, because you don't know who's going to be reviewing. You want to make sure that you have little bits that are going to tug at the heartstrings or evoke an emotional response, but also have some hard hitting data for those people who want it, right? And that's a that's a really great point that Brie made to um, to write and and present this. Like you know, you don't know who the reviewer is. Okay, how's everybody doing? I know we're throwing a lot at you in a very quick amount of time. Um, please, by knowing if you need to go get a drink of water, stand up, we're not here to judge. Um, okay, so this is one of my favorite things to play with. Uh, again, I'm, I kind of like to try to bring these creative techniques into grant writing because it can be so technical. And um, I think it's it's good to to bring some of these perspectives in because it livens up our writing and mood is one of those things tone as well but specifically mood because mood equals the feeling right or the atmosphere that the writer is trying to evoke or create uh, and get the reader to respond to it could be right like a sense of calm or maybe it's joy and optimism or anger urgency uh maybe a little fear um, that's not to say that you have to include all of, you know, all of these, these are just examples into your writing, but really think about when you're writing and you're sharing your story, your message, what impact you're creating in the community or across the state, um, what do you want the reader to feel, right? Do you want them to feel the sense of urgency that you, you know, with COVID and people responding to homelessness and, you know, utilities being cut off and basic needs needing to be met, right? There was an urgent response that needed to be met. And you could reflect that a little bit in your writing by choosing words that maybe highlighted the urgency and kind of evoked that language um, and really made the reader feel the urgency that you were seeing in your community. Or maybe you just want to show how optimistic and hopeful your program is going to make people, right? And you want to play with words that really highlight um, that optimism. So think about this when you're sharing your story, particularly little Friday, right? Uh, particularly, <laughs> um, I think in your need statement, and in your program description, right? When you're really talking about like the meat and potatoes of what you do, that's a great, great opportunity to really think about the mood that you're trying to set and, and the emotional response that you want the reviewer or the reader your proposal to feel. Um, so mood leads to an emotional resonance, right? It's gonna resonate and sit well with the people that are, are reading your uh, proposal, right? They're going to, if you're evoking a certain response, they're going to have a more physical or visceral reaction to it. And that's good. That means they're paying attention, right? Um, it's going to keep them engaged and probably make them remember you more. 
And what I'd love for you to do, uh, maybe when we have some, uh, some time to practice this or when you, when you have some time in the office, when you're writing your next grant, um, play around with your word choice and really sit down and think about, okay, what feeling or mood am I trying to create here? What response do I want? And then start brainstorming a list of words that you think about that create that mood, right? If you're writing, this is not related to grants at all, but right, if you're talking about Halloween, right, you're probably talking about like a dark and misty night and it was a moonlit evening and there was fog rolling on that rate right? like I'm using words that make me think a certain way kind of brings me to that setting and it's making me feel like oh yeah I'm getting eerie vibes I'm getting spooky vibes it's definitely Halloween so use some of that in your writing not necessarily Halloween but uh you know brainstorm a list of words that really really bring that feeling to life uh, and this is a really, I think, fun exercise to also kind of get you out of your head, uh, in my opinion. So what this looks like in practice. Um, so one example is this top one here. We were trying to create, um, again, kind of a sense of urgency and really for this particular organization highlight the issue of personal safety that this organization was experiencing and kind of the anxiety and trauma around that. So we originally kind of had it very short and said, because of the current political climate and rise in violence against minorities, we have felt the need to protect our staff, volunteers, and supporters now more than ever. Again, not a bad sentence. Uh, we're talking about the current political climate and violence against minorities. You know, that definitely produces a response. But then, you know, I, I thought about it and I was like, okay, another way you can do that is not only just with the word choice, but with the sentence style. So it could be more of an ex exclamatory statement or an, ex uh, you know, an informative statement, or you can use rhetorical questions. And that's kind of what I did here was I said, does the color of your skin make you fear for your safety? Does the color of your skin make you feel vulnerable at work? Does the work that you do solicit, solicit threats from hate groups and white supremacists? Think about that. Being a Black-led, female-run social justice organization, these concerns are part of our daily experience. And then we added that same sentence to it. And it created a much stronger emotion because not only were we saying, because of the political climate and the violence that's rising, we feel the need to protect our staff and, and buy this security equipment. We put it back to the reader and says, and said, you know, I want you to think and feel this, right? Do you experience this? And we use that through this question, but also some of the language that we chose. Um, and this is another example. Uh, we were trying to convey the, the sense of like belonging and, and safe space for this particular um, project that they were trying to to purchase to expand their classroom. Um, and so we want our yurt classroom to be a safe and accessible space for all our participants. And what we did is we had some feedback that said, you know, really paint a picture of what this is going to do. So when you're working with kids, especially around like snow, we were like, okay, we're going to dig into the warm, cozy vibes. So we said, we want our students and community members to feel a sense of warmth so now we're using, okay, warmth, we're trying to think cozy and belonging when they participate in our programs and use our facilities. Imagine, so now we're putting it back to the reader to take it into their own mind. Imagine a space where students are bustling about with their friends and sharing their favorite moments from a ski lesson or laughing together while they test out new skills they learned. Picture participants warming up in the yurt classroom and drinking hot chocolate after a day out on the trails. Now, this is also to be said, we definitely had a good sense of the funder. They were a, a female organization um, and we felt this approach was definitely called for. You know, I wouldn't say that using this much fluffy language that we used here, it may not work for all settings, right? But we, we had a, a strong sense of the funder. We wanted to create this response. We had the character word limit to do it. Um, so we did. 
And I think it is kind of a nice way to show that mood and feeling and using different language or different tactics like rhetorical questions or sentence style can really add some, um, some flavor and excitement to your writing. And again, I know we're going through this quickly, but if you have any questions, um, please go ahead and save them for the end or write them in the chat box and we'll uh, breeze breeze on here. I think, you know, kind of monitoring it and Jill is as well. So um, please be thinking about if any of this applies to your writing or your organization, you have a question about it, definitely let us know. Okay. And this is, I think, the last tactic we're going to talk about um, and also a personal favorite. I think I said that for everything. So I clearly like all of the writing tactics that we're using. Um, so but I, I do really love to use data. Um, and you can use data to add impact. And sometimes, depending on the way that you use data, it can be a way to shorten things without using as much language. You might be able to throw in a number or a statistic that kind of conveys the same message in a lot fewer characters. That's not always the case though. Some of these examples you'll see, uh, again, I wrote them, so they're, uh, they tend to be a little on the longer side with a lot more data because that's a tactic I like. Um, so data can be a lot of different things, right? It can be statistics. Um, it can be organizational specific data. So it could be internal or I guess external, um, but very specific to the results or programming of your organization, right? Your participation rates or how many people you've served. Um, how many classes you offer or looking at outcomes and impacts that you've created. It could be testimonials, right? That's a set, uh, a set of data from your participants or your clients. Um, it could also be more community driven, right? As a whole, uh, rather than just organizational specific, it could be more local like Gallatin Valley specific or state. Maybe it's across the state of Montana. This is something we often look at uh, when we're talking about like mental health or suicide rates, I'll tend to pull states about the whole kind of state of Montana and some of the, the really high disparities that we have in regards to that. Uh, or you can use national data if it makes sense to compare your organization or your program to, to national data or organizations that are doing similar work in other regions across the country. Um, and for me, again, it's really kind of fun to dig in and find this information. And you can do that a couple different ways, either by looking up similar organizations, um, you know, going on to online databases. There's some great resources at the library that are for free that um, are academic, uh, academic journals where you can find uh, peer reviewed research or articles that have some really great statistics on maybe mental health or physical health for children, pregnant women and postpartum depression. Um, it, there's some great resources there. And Google is also a really great option, but you just have to be careful where your source is coming from. And then for me, again, this comes back to use data and statistics to add more weight or I guess concrete, uh, a sense of concrete, like tangible deliverables, right, to your message. Um, because sometimes readers want to see that, right? They want to have a little more tangible results. And you can, rather than just saying something, you can throw in a statistic. And I'll show you a good example of that on the next slide. Um, data and, and that supporting information really backs up the claims that you're making, right? When you're talking about the need that you're serving and how you're helping, having some data about why the model you've chosen for your program is actually a really good model to meet that need can really back up your claim. Um, so this is overall just a really great method to use. And again, when you're feeling kind of stuck in your writing, it's nice to be able to go find some new data because the great thing about being alive, right, is that the years keep going by and we keep getting new information, new data that presents itself, whether it be from our organization and programs or just nationally, um, you know, recognized uh, information. So this is just a really simple way. And if you 
like me, kind of like to be a bit of a detective, you can go online and search for some of this data um, or statistics to add back into your writing and try to spice it up um, and play around with it. Maybe a certain funder, again, going back to that funder alignment, maybe you really see a funder um, liking a female workforce development. So you find some really valuable information on a workforce development around, you know, females in the Gallatin Valley or maybe across the state of Montana and other programs that are happening, right? That it's growing or what, we're, what you're doing in your organization. So in practice, this looks like, um, again, a very simple statement. This is not a bad statement. Um, our program has grown over the last three years. It's very simple, it's straight to the point, it's direct and it, I know what they're talking about. But if you wanna take it to the next level, consider using, this is an example of like organizational data. Um, consider throwing in a statistic to say the same thing, but give it more weight, right? It's more concrete now. If we say over the last three years, we have witnessed a 22% increase in participation, in program participation. Um, and it's the same, message, right? We're still talking about growth and that we've grown over the last three years, but now there's a more tangible result, right? Oh, they've grown 22% over the last three years. Wow, that's pretty impressive, right? It gets them talking more about that deliverable um, and just adds a little more weight and impact to the, to the sentence, right? To what your message is saying. Um, another example of, again, this is organizational data and some of the examples following this have more national uh, examples of data. Again, just because I like, I like to use data. So that's what you'll see in some of my examples um, is it is our goal to offer accessible, low cost education and recreation opportunities for children and underserved communities across the state. We could end it right there, right? If we're trying to cut, you know, okay, we've talked about our goal. It's to offer accessible, low cost education and recreation to underserved children. Great, I know what you're saying. It's very clear, direct and to the point. Um, but we, and rather than trying to replace any of that, we have the ability to kind of add on. So we gave it more context by not only saying, well, we wanna do this, but we gave context to who this community was. So it says 57% of schools that we serve are rural schools and more than three quarters of those schools are title one schools which means children from low income families make up at least 40% of enrollment. So now we're using some organizational specific data and some area specific data um, to kind of back up this, the reason, right, of why the goal is to offer accessible and low cost education, because there's a need within these rural communities and these Title I schools to have those accessible opportunities. So it just gives a little bit more context, I would say, and just, adds a little more impact. And I want to add one thing too about data. Yeah. While, you know, sometimes you have the option to add or not add, but yeah. when working with state and federal grants, a lot of the feedback that I've received or learned is if you make a statement and it is not backed with some of these statistics, it doesn't mm -hmm. score well. You can't right. just be a person saying, hey, we're serving all of these rural kids and they just have to believe that. You need right. to be saying how many um, and you need to have proof of that. So sometimes it's nice because you have the option to add it, but other times, you know, with state and federal, it's really not an option. And so having this data in some sort of saved document too, so that you can continue to pull that and keep researching and adding to that saved document. So you always have little ones to plug and play here and there if you're short on time. But I do feel like, especially coming from the, Hannah and I have two different personality styles when it comes to writing. Mm -hmm. I am very much a budget lover. I open the budget first. I should be able to see your story from your budget. And then I want to see what are you asking? And I'm, I'm a lot more straightforward and direct. So it is nice for me when I get these to have that because you can tell me that first sentence and I'm like, great but are you, like how much are you actually doing? So just wanted to point out that I do, this piece for me is really like, that's a great statement, 
and tell me more. <laughs> it's what, if anyone here is in the theater world, I always kind of refer back to improv. It's a yes and statement in improv. You're always, you're not supposed to deny anyone because you're giving them a gift, right? It's yes, I hear what you're saying and I'm gonna build on it and take this story further. So I always like to call these like, oh, that's my yes and paragraph. I'm giving them more. They haven't asked for it necessarily, but I'm giving them more. Um, and great point, Brie, about the federal grants. There are some instances where you do need not, it's not only just, you know, a, a nice extra, you do need to have this. Um, and that's really important to know. Okay, so we're going to practice and um, we're going to do this from the lens of a need statement. And when I'm breaking down a need statement, trying to really, really talk about um, what the community need is, particularly um, what, what issue I'm addressing, I wanna talk about these four components and it doesn't mean they have to be super long paragraphs. You'll see the examples I have are maybe a little wordy, um, but they can be a couple of sentences. And one thing for the people who said that they struggled with starting is, and I'll show you kind of in the next slide, is when you look at a question, rather, and this is how I think, because again, I like the fluffy creative language. I'm like, oh gosh, how am I gonna tell a story? And I think of it in this like big, big picture, and then I overwhelm myself and I can't start because I want it to be perfect and I want it to sound good. And then I can't start for like two hours because I'm in my head. But when you're addressing a question, it's really a great tactic to start with bullet points. And I know that sounds super basic, but when you're looking at a question, sometimes it's easier for us to say, okay, in quick bullet points or key phrases, what are the main things that I need to answer in this question? Description of the problem, recognition of the problem, and we'll get into this, but just start with bullet points. And that at least gets it out of your head and onto paper. And then when you see the bullet points, it's almost like a little outline for yourself. And you can think, okay, if these are the components that I need to talk about to answer this question, then I can just turn these bullet points into really simple, maybe direct sentences. And then you have a great starting point and a building block. And maybe the next day or a couple days later, you can come back to that really simple paragraph that you've crafted out of those bullet points and think, okay, now thinking about some of these tactics we've talked about, can I create a mood using language? Should I add some data in here? Can I vary my sentence structure a little bit and add some rhythm, right? And think about how you can build on it rather than thinking of building that whole thing right up front. So we're going to kind of go through this and I see I want to make sure we have time for any questions. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of time to kind of put some of these things into practice, just some of these techniques and maybe it's not actually writing. Maybe it's just kind of making notes to yourself about what you want to go tweak in your own applications. But what we've done is taken each of these components of a need statement that I like to answer uh, and, and try to address in a need statement and think about how you can improve the sentence. Now, we offer you this creative writing challenge. If you want to um, use the, the kind of basic sentence or paragraph that we've provided you, um, it's okay to take this and just use it as a creative exercise. Make up data or words, like we're not gonna judge you if you have absolutely no idea what you're talking about in this particular sector or industry. Um, it's just kind of a fun exercise. If you'd rather not try to go off of what we've provided, um, please feel free to try to answer this question with your own organization in mind and maybe start with bullet points and build out or think about how, you know, what tactics you can use to answer this question. Um, and we'll try to do these fairly, we'll go through it, we'll, we'll give you some time on a few of these and then we'll just kind of go over a few for example, but um, description of the problem. So this really, when you're talking about a need statement is what is the problem? What, right? What is the problem you are trying to solve? And here we have girls, the problem, right, is that girls are not entering the field of STEM because they aren't pursuing these courses in high school or beyond. 
So we're going to give you a few minutes. You can see kind of how I've adapted it. Again, I like compound sentences and I like data. So this is a little bit longer. It doesn't have to be this long. Um, but using some of the things that we've talked about today, some of the techniques and just mindset shifts, how would you either change this sentence or use your own organization as an example and and see how you would answer what is the problem you're trying to solve using some of the tactics that we've talked about today. And we'll just give you maybe like a minute to kind of jot that down. I still see some people writing, so we're just going to give you a few more seconds to kind of, you know, wrap up your thoughts, maybe make a few notes to yourself. Okay, go ahead and wrap up those thoughts or, or keep on writing while I just kind of go over this next question so you can see. Recognition of the problem is another component I like to address when talking about the need statement. So we've talked about the what, now we wanna address the why. And this is where for me, I really like to use data when it comes to answering this why question. Um, so why is this a problem? Why is what you've talked about a problem in your community or the state? So we made this really direct. Obviously, it's a bigger issue than this, but we just said here, the rate of women in computer science specifically has declined since the 1990s. This isn't a bad sentence. This is perfectly acceptable. It got right to the point. But how do we level this up, right? How do we add more feeling, more context, more data to make this more compelling? And what we've done here is used statistics um, to really drive home this, this need and this why. So we're supporting this claim that we're making. So we said between 1990 and 2013, the rate of computer science jobs filled by women went from 35% to 24 and has since declined to 18%. Now we could stop there. Again, that's a perfectly acceptable sentence, but I have the too much gene um, and my yes and tendencies kept going. So I said, According to the American Association of University Women, we can reverse this trend by removing negative connotations around women in computer science and engaging girls at the elementary level. And for this particular project that we're working on, this makes a lot of sense. We're working with girls in kind of that fourth to eighth grade range. So we really wanted to use data to say, okay, the rate of women in computer science, not just STEM overall, but computer science is declining. Um, but we can reverse this, right? We gave a little bit of optimism there. So what I'd like you to do is again, just take a minute. Um, and if you'd like to kind of play around with, with the, the theme that we have going, you wanna make up something and, and build off of the sentence that we have, be my guest, use it as a creative exercise um, or use your own organization. And we'll give you just uh, a minute to, to kind of make some notes about how you might answer this.
Okay. Now these next ones, um, I would invite you all, I'm just kind of going to show you again the example and offer you the question, but for the sake of time, go ahead and, you know, just think about how you might make some of these changes uh, to your own writing. So another question when addressing the need statement is, what will happen to your community? So the implication if it's not solved. Um, and here we said, well, if we don't get more women in the STEM field, there will continue to be a gender and wealth gap in the industry. And in our example, we've talked, we've gone into, again, some more national statistics about the, you know, the Bureau of Labor statistics, the median salary for computer scientists, and what that means to this community. Um, and then another example is why your organization. So what makes your organization the right one to solve this problem? And this is where you really want to talk about, you know, your, your qualifications or your program uniqueness and what models you're using or uh, different methods that you're employing, right? Um, and this is just another example we've talked about. We, again, we use some data uh, to kind of show that um, research suggests that school programs targeting this uh, 11 to 14 year old age uh, and it's dedicated to females only is really powerful in getting women to continue on in their STEM studies. So these are just some examples and some questions to get you thinking. Um, if anyone would like to share, we're not going to do breakout since I am a chatty Kathy and we really dove into some of these examples, um, but if anyone would like to share takeaways that they think are going to, they're going to use in the writing or an example that you actually wrote during some of this time, um, please feel free to unmute yourself and share or just type it into the chat. Um, I'd love to hear just kind of what you're thinking about using for your own organization and your own writing. And then I would also, um, if no one wants to share, which I get, it's Friday, vacation Friday. Um, if you don't feel comfortable sharing, are there any questions about how to use some of these techniques or questions about your own writing that you'd like to ask us? I want to remind everybody, as always with Nonprofit Cafe, that you are going to get out of it what you put into it. So I hope that some people will share, but I will start and model this because Hannah said it was simple, but to those of us who are not writers, I know it is not. I have never, ever before thought about alternating the length of my sentences. <laughs> I'm like the most robotic, boring, short sentence, data-driven writer ever. And so that was something that you said was simple that I thought... Um, was actually kind of revolutionary for my I love, that. I love that. And this is also to say, right, these are all just suggestions and tips. Um, take what you feel like will work for you. And again, um, practice makes perfect, right? I can say this because I've been writing for a while. Um, and I know sometimes it's hard to change our writing habits, but um, I did want to come across as having just simple techniques, right, that aren't these big, long, crazy formulas or uh, you know, these mindset shifts that are fairly simple to think about, but can make a big impact. And for you, like Jill said, it may not seem simple. Um, and I love that you pointed that out, Jill. Thank you so much. Um, cause it does seem so simple to me. Um, but it might not for you and that's okay. And just remember to keep the more you write, the more you read, honestly, the more you read and listen and, um, consume, data and the written language, the easier it does get to write. And the more you write and start with bullet points and just kind of brainstorm words, you'll get into that mode and it, it will come a little easier thinking about some of these things. Okay, well, if, um, if nobody has any questions, that's totally fine. Uh, there are ways to contact us if you, after this session, 
do have questions or you just don't feel like asking now, that's totally okay. Um, we offer free 30 minute discovery calls. And this is really just an opportunity for you to kind of pick our brain, whether it be you'd like to utilize some of our writing services or you're like, Hannah, I have a question. I have this paragraph and I don't know how to work through it. And I'd like to brainstorm some, some ideas off of you. How can we make this better? Or I'm really stuck with research and I don't know how to get over that. You know, I want more information on, on how to research grants effectively. Um, we are here to listen, to learn about your organization and help you however we can, whether that's just being a sounding board and helping you brainstorm some ideas to get you unstuck or telling you how you can work with us if that's something that you need. Uh, and we do offer a couple of different packages, uh, depending on what your needs are. So we offer a grant readiness package, which is really for um, organizations typically who are smaller or in transition um, and haven't really written grants before, or maybe they have and you just haven't been successful. Um, and you're not quite sure if you're ready to pursue grants, if you have all the documentation you need, uh, and if you're ready and going to be competitive in the funding world. Um, we offer a package that really helps kind of assess that, helps implement some of those documents and kind of see where you're at and how you can make changes, as well as a grant research package um, where we prospect for you. We get this a lot where people are like, I just don't know where to start with grants. And for us, we're researching all the time. So it's something we love to do or I love to do because again, I like to pretend I'm a detective. Um, and this is where we identify prospects for you and give you a comprehensive list uh, of, of funders that we feel are a good fit for your mission and the programs and goals that you have. Uh, we also offer monthly writing contracts. If you're just like, I don't have time to do any of this, I need a writer to do it for me. We do offer monthly contracts where uh, we become a part of your team, essentially, and we go through this all. We go through readiness, we do the research, we help you write uh, the grants and submit them on your behalf, and we even do some reporting. Um, and then we also have personal grant coaching. So if you were like, gosh, I really like some of these tactics, but I'd like to learn more about the whole process overall um, from start to finish, right? From readiness to research and how to use this writing in a one-on-one -on -one setting where you're really getting direct feedback on your own writing, on your own grant seeking process uh, for your organization, you can um, take our Mastering Grants training program, which is an eight week course. Um, and we also are closely working with the incumbent worker training program through the Department of Labor that offers a grant for people like all of you who need skills training um, to be reimbursed up to $2,000, um, depending on your eligibility, to take courses essentially for free. Um, and our course is one of the, the qualified courses um, where if you apply for this grant and you are eligible and get awarded, you could take our training and then at the end of it be reimbursed the cost of the training. So it's really just an upfront payment that you get reimbursed reimbursed for at the end. And we go through readiness, the research, how to find grants, uh, going through the databases, creating a list, doing one-on-one -on -one writing, getting direct feedback from us on your writing, um, and really talking about how to build those funder relationships. So if that's something you're interested in, go ahead and give us the call. We are here for all of you. And thank you all so much for joining us on this lovely sunny Friday. Um, that is all from us. We hope you enjoyed this and we hope you can now go enjoy your Memorial Day weekend and get into the sunshine. I will toss this back over to Jill um, if you have any wrap up announcements for everybody. Anna, um, I just wanted to make one comment because you were asking what things that people learned. Yeah. I, I tend to be very fact data driven and you had some nice examples how just in a sentence or two, you can give the reader a real feel for the organization. And that helps me to move a little bit in that direction. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm, uh, I'm really glad we could help you kind of uh, understand that a little more. And, and you'll have to let us know how you, how you use it in your own writing. 
Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Hannah and Bree, thank you so much. Um, I have to say it is no wonder that Hannah just broke a million stinking dollars <laughs> for her clients. Have you seen her writing in this session? It has made me rethink every grant application I have ever written without your help. Um, but thank you for the tips today. Thank you for sharing. Again, everyone who is on the session today, utilize Bree and Hannah. They are some of the most qualified grant consultants and most successful grant consultants in our community. We are so lucky and honored and humbled to have them share their knowledge with us. Um, you two are gems to this community and we are so grateful for you. Um, and to everyone on the call today, I hope that you all have a fantastic summer. Um, Nonprofit Cafe will be taking a break, as I said at the beginning of the session, until August so that we can take some time to regroup and um, decide what next year's program looks like. So if you have any feedback as to whether you enjoyed the virtual sessions during COVID or you want to see this return to an in-person program, if there are any specific topics you want to learn about or any specific speakers that you think could really share some knowledge, please, please, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, but Hannah and Bree's contact information is on the screen right now. I encourage you to jot it down. Um, if you need to write a grant for literally anything, these are your girls to support you in that effort. So um, utilize them. They are a fantastic resource. And I hope that everyone has a great Memorial Day and a great summer. And we so appreciate you taking the time to come and learn with us. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jill. And thank you, Jill, for having us. Thank you, everybody, for coming.